Welcome to Alternative Investing. I'm Paul Walden sitting in for Mark Bunting. My co-host is David Kaufman. He, of course, is president of West Court Capital. And this show is a, way, is a shift away from our usual focus on stocks and bonds. And we explore investment concepts that help you break away from the pack and potentially capitalize on some big gains. On today's program, we're going to be looking at long, short equity hedge funds. And David, let's, let's walk through this first of all, because everybody knows kind of what long means. You, know, you buy stocks, you hang on to them. Tell us what the long, short objective is. Yeah, let's start with the concept that, that the, the vast majority of Canadians, of course, own equities one way or another. And of those equities, the vast majority of those are long only, meaning buy and hold. And whether you're in mutual funds or in a direct brokerage account or a managed account with the broker, uh, essentially what happens is because you're long, meaning that you own stock, uh, you have to wake up every morning along with your broker and be a bull. You have to right. hope that things go up. But of course, as we know, we have a lot of reminders of this in the not too distant past, things don't always work that way. And so what hedge funds generally, and long short hedge funds specifically, allow is the use, and I think we have a board for this, of three differentiating characteristics. As we've discussed before on this show, one is the use of leverage, the second is the ability to sell short, and the third is the ability to use derivatives. And any of these things, three things can be used to enhance returns or to diversify risk. And if the goal, of course, is capital preservation and to make the bumpy ride a little less bumpy, those three tools could be generally used to diversify risk. So what happens is if you have a long-only portfolio of, say, $100, and you want to end up with a 130-30, which is what we hear about all the time with these hedge funds, you take $100 and then you, you, you go long. You sell short $30, $30 worth of stock that you don't like. And when you do that, you receive $30, and you use that 30 to buy even more of the stock that you do like. So you end up with 130 long and 30 short, which is known as net 100% exposure. Mm -hmm. But the weighting can change from manager to manager. So uh, we've talked before on this show about equity market neutral, which is net no exposure, zero exposure, which is 100 long and 100 short. Same idea. It's just the weightings that change. So l l walk us through some sectors here. Where do you use this kind of strategy? In theory, the sectors can be, can be any sector, anywhere, at any time. But what happens in reality, because no, no manager knows everything about the world of equities in every possible market, is that you will, you, the manager will specialize either by, for example, geography, market capitalization, or sector. And so what you often see is, is either at a point in time or generally speaking, you'll have a manager that, for example, could be Canadian mid-cap resource focused. Mm -hmm. So you've got the geography, the capitalization, and the sector built into that. Or you could be Canadian large cap financials, or you could go anywhere else in the world uh, and achieve the same thing. We talk about the concept of alpha, which is another way to say manager skill. And most people agree that alpha is more easily extracted among those choices in the less efficient markets. So that would usually be in the small or the mid-cap. And the reason they're less efficient is they're less better known. They don't have hundreds of analysts across the country covering them every day. And it allows the opportunity for those managers to extract uh, alpha by exerting skill. The downside of, of small and mid-cap is typically meant, uh, said to be that they can be less liquid, there can be capacity constraints, and it also can be difficult to put on shorts because they're not always available uh, to borrow in order to put on those shorts. All right, so walk me through some trading strategies here. How, how do you actually execute this plan? And once again, you can have, and we'll talk about this with our guests for mm -hmm. sure today, you can have almost any strategy at any time, but there are some strategies that are more popular and those that are less popular. So you can have a top-down, bottom-up value approach, which is classic Warren Buffett. Uh, you can use quantitative approach, which is more algorithmic, and this is where you get all the PhDs and the physicists right. who determine what's going to happen in the future by what's happened in the past, except when it doesn't. And you can be either long-term or short-term. And when I say short-term, I'm not alluding to uh, high-speed trading. Most long-short managers do not, uh, do not practice high-speed microsecond trading. They leave that to the people who specialize in that because that has very little to do with value or anything along those lines and everything to do uh, with speed. And that's, that, that's taking very small gains along the way in very high speed. And also, you, you don't see long-short managers that focus usually on event-driven strategies, such as merger arbitrage, uh, because that, again, is left up to the people who specialize in that space 
who will enter into a strategy of, of going long a company that's being acquired and short the company who's mm -hmm. doing the acquiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people who do that are specialists in that space. And so you, you don't usually see the long short managers doing that sort of thing. And so for retail investors, they, they hear the word hedge funds, they get nervous, they get you know, excited, they, they see all the horrible things that have gone on. What is it, what's in it for them? How do they access these kinds of products? Well, a, a retail investor is usually not uh, able to access a true hedge fund unless they're an accredited investor, right. which in Ontario is a high bar, which means they have a million dollars in financial assets or a high income. In the rest of the country, if the product is sold through an offering memorandum, the bar is set much lower. Uh, but there are uh, other ways for people to participate in this strategy uh, using uh, ETFs and option strategies. Uh, sometimes, some ETFs actually have built-in option strategies in order to benefit from the hedging that, that is not available in a long-only, say, mutual fund mm -hmm. or in your long-only equity portfolio. But uh, some of the best managers in the space run hedge funds, which unfortunately are only available mm -hmm. to the high net worth individuals. Okay. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but coming up, we'll talk to two portfolio managers about their long-short equity positions. Stay with us. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. Tonight we are looking at long, short hedge, sorry, equity hedge funds. And joining us to talk about this is Andrea Horan. She is principal at Agilith Capital. And Steve Turner, he is CEO of Triumph Asset Management. And welcome to both of you. Uh, Andrea, let's start off. Just tell us a little bit about your fund, Agilith. What do you guys do and um, okay. how it's doing? We are a uh, North American publicly traded equity investor. So we're looking at uh, all kinds of... of uh, of investments but outside of the resource sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a fund it kind of offers investors a bit of a diversification tool against the TSX. Um, our background is very much based in uh, fundamentals. I spent most of my, my career on the uh, sell side as an equity research analyst and then director of research and my partner Patrick spent his time most of the past 20 years managing uh, mutual funds and pension funds and, and most recently Agile. So we, we have a strong background in fundamental analysis. That's what we use to underpin our investment decisions. We're looking for solid business models, strong free cash flow, uh, defendable competitive advantages. And what we try to do is allocate capital both to where we see opportunity within the companies as well as where through our backgrounds we have a competitive advantage in understanding the, the stocks, which is actually why we're not in resources. Okay. And Steve, tell us a bit about Triumph. Um, so Triumph has two funds. One, one is the Triumph Capital Appreciation Fund. The other is Triumph Aggressive Opportunities Fund. Mm -hmm. um, we're long-term investors. Both funds are, are focused in North American equities. Um, we run concentrated portfolios. We started the firm in 2005. Um, the first fund I mentioned, uh, Capital Appreciation, has about $100 million under management. It's compounded about 11% a year since it started, which is about mm -hmm. double the index. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that after. And then the second is the Aggressive Opportunities Fund, which is smaller cap focused and, and more concentrated. Um, it has about $25 million under management. It's compounded about 8% versus its benchmark, which I think is... is uh, almost uh, about zero since inception. Okay. And before we talk about performance, uh, Andrea alluded to the fact that because of their specialization that they focus on pretty much everything but resources. And am I right in saying that, that you have A, the concentration, and B, a lot of concentration in Canadian resources? Is that right? Um, so the, you know, the, the TSX is divided about 50% uh, resources, 50% non-resources. Our biggest position happens to be Apple. Uh, which obviously is, is non-resourcey. But right now we are about 65% resources and 35% not. Okay, so let's turn to performance. Of course, we've got to let the rubber hit the road. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Andrea, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the performance of your fund and, and talk uh, especially a little bit about the down, the, the, the up-down up, uh, period of 07, 08, 09 because we learn a lot about funds by looking at that, that position. Sure, I mean... It if, if nothing else, 08, 09 was a, a stress test for, for funds. And uh, our fund uh, went down about with the market. Um, and then uh, we were up about 100% in 2009. And, uh, you know, it's worth, I guess, pointing out that 
we continued to invest in uh, 2008, and I think that one of one of the uh, the things that hurt us because we were actually well ahead until the fourth quarter is is we called a little early the the end of the bear. Uh, but the continuing to invest and find uh, new companies trading at discounts, trading below cash value, uh, absolutely positioned us for the strong rebound in uh, in 2009, and, and we continue to outperform in 2010. We were up uh, uh, almost 20% in 2010, and and we're uh, so far this year outperforming as well. So and notably, I, I noticed today in an email I got that that uh, in May, which was a brutal month for a lot of investors in the Canadian markets, that you actually were up. Is that right? Uh, yes, a full 20 basis points, but every basis point was hard fought. <laughs> Everything counts. Yeah. So, Stephen, you want to talk to us about your performance? Yeah, I mean, I I, I sort of want to go back for a second, just talk. Um, about the firm, and then, and then I'll tie it into to, to the performance. Um, you know, I think I think like the same as Andy, and and, and I know Patrick, uh, and my partner Bruce knows Patrick well also. Um, you know, most hedge funds characterize the same thing. We're we're typically well educated. Um, you know, we have vast experiences uh, in financial markets. Um, we're all typically driven, and we're all independent thinkers. I think that's normal. Um, I think what we do a little bit differently at Triumph is two things. One's our investment process um, that's unique, and two is the, the, the commitment that the partners have to the invested capital. So, so we are all, um, as a group, the largest y unit holders um, I in our firm. So in 2008, since you know, we have a, a fairly long-term horizon, what we learned is, is that all the best companies um, – fared well coming through it and if you just stuck to your guns and, and actually didn't flinch you typically recovered most of the money so we we characterize I think An Andrew's firm's done great but I think the real measure of, of success is how quickly you return to, to your old high watermark or, or old highs and, and uh, I think both of, both our firms are, are, are in the chips in that respect, so, mm. so that's great. I, I think the trick is to not think about one year or the other year in terms of performance, but really look at how people did through the cycle. Right. Because the worst, of course, that you can do is you know, get chased out at the bottom and then move to cash rate at the wrong time and never get the money back. True enough, yeah. All right, well, let's talk about some practicalities here. Angie, let me start with you uh, and then Steve as well. How do you pick your longs, and, and tell us a bit about the strategy involved uh, when you when you take a short position? Sure, um, we we kind of think about our long positions uh, in three buckets, if you will. So we've got our our long term holdings, and some of our stocks we've held since inception, three and a half years ago. And there, what we're really looking for is stocks that have exposure to great secular growth stories. So maybe the explosion in demand for bandwidth, mm -hmm. and then we try to look at okay, here are the stocks that have exposure to that. Who are best positioned? Who have a defendable moat? Who are world-class, you know, diversified customer base? And and that's obviously a critical strategy for small cap. Um, our medium-term holdings, really, what we're looking for is is changes in the profile. Either mm -hmm. it's a former market darling whose growth is starting to crack, but it isn't it's still trading at a high multiple, or you know, the reverse where. Uh, they've just come through a tough period uh, of restructuring. Their cash flow is about right. to explode. And, okay. and then we've got our, our uh, you know, more short-term tactical trading uh, that can be long okay. or short that's more event-driven. And how does the shorting play into all this? Well, I mean, shorting works well for changes in, in you know, uh, market stories. It works well for event-driven. We'll also uh, tilt the portfolio a little bit. Depending on, as you know, over the last few years, we've had sort of risk on, risk right, off. Right, right. Okay. So we'll, we'll use the shorts to sort of de-risk or, or take on a okay. little bit more. And Steve, what about you guys? Um, well, I guess our investment process isn't as unique as I thought because it's not that dissimilar. <laughs> <to anybody. laughs> That's okay. So it's no longer unique. But, but, but we, we, I mean, we, we, we take the normal um, methodology of investing. The one thing we do is we overlay a top-down um, process. So, so our view is we try to find um, industries with long-term sustainable margins, and we, we'd rather have that as a tailwind than, than swim upstream um, okay. with a great company in a bad industry. Okay. We then take that, um, we look for the best companies with the highest ROEs, we do lots of valuation work, um, and scenario test it for upside and sort of downside in a bad case. And then we basically sit and wait for our opportunities to, to, to deploy the capital. Okay. On the short side, j yep, just, sure. just to answer that, um, 
two primary reasons. One's to hedge right. um, and the other's to make money. If, there, if there's a directional opportunity, uh, we'll, we'll take it and deploy capital. Okay. All right. We're going to take another quick break, but coming up next, we'll look at the use of leverage in long short strategies. David Kaufman is one of Canada's leading experts on alternative investing. He is the president of Westcourt Capital, a registered exempt market dealer. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I'm here with David Kaufman, president of Westcourt Capital, and joining us is Andrea Horan, principal at Agileth Capital and Steve Tuckner, CEO of Triumph Asset Management. And let's talk about leverage. Uh, Andrea, how do you guys use leverage and how does it work? We, we will use a modest amount of leverage at times. Right yeah. now we're not, we're not using leverage, but it's, it's basically like a margin account. Um, so it, if we see uh, more opportunity, we might take on a bit of, of margin debt essentially to enhance our long positions. Okay, and Steve? Um, you know, we've sort of looked back at, at, at the stock market going back to, to 1962, and there's been three moments in history um, that have been unique. One's 1974 when uh, the P of the, of the stock market was about eight times earnings and, and long bond was at 10% um, and stocks were uh, a raging buy. That's when Buffett made all his money. The other's 2000 when the P was about 30 mm -hmm. um, and your long bond was 5% which was disadvantageous to own stocks. Um, today is a unique opportunity because the um, earnings yield of the S&P is about 8% and the long bond which is the most um, overinflated, uh, you know, overhyped and overpopular um, asset class probably on earth today um, is yielding about 3%. And um, we believe now is the time to buy stocks. So, so at this current moment, we've a actually deployed, you know, modest but, but, but very modest leverage. We're probably about 10% levered. Um, going back in history, our returns, none of them have been generated um, utilizing leverage. So it's, it's all generated using um, concentration. And then the tools available, um, shorting and, and hedging, have helped us. Okay. So even though both of you attribute your, your uh, outsized performance to alpha rather than to leverage clearly, it's interesting. The conversation we're having here is not so dissimilar to the conversation that you'd have with long-only managers sitting around the same table. Uh, and what I'm wondering is if someone likes what they hear about, about an equity long-short hedge fund, hedge funds in general, uh, should they be diversifying out of their existing equity portfolio, or would you prefer that they have a bucket that they, for alternative investments, that they take it out of that bucket from a portfolio construction point of view? It, you know, to me, it depends on, on what they own. The you know, mutual funds being 90% to 100% to long are, are effectively, you know, by, by and large, chronic underperformers, uh, fairly you know, high fee charging, and... Um, they represent about 20% of, of total assets under management. Depending on the type of hedge fund manager, and Andrea, you know, and I, our firms are, are equity hedge funds, and um, as such, they don't necessarily um, have the same uh, risk profile as you know derivative hedge funds might. So, in my opinion, uh, I, I would have no money in, in mutual funds. I'd either have hedge funds or index funds. I'm sure you're not going to disagree, but you want to answer the same question? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess all that I would add is that in determining which bucket you're going to put a fund, uh, you need to understand what the fund's strategy is. So in the case of, of our fund at Agileth and, and I think at, at Triumph as well, they're directional equity funds. So it makes sense to think about those as part of your equity bucket. There are other, other you know, alternative strategies that run much more market neutral, non-correlated, that really shouldn't be part of your equity allocation. Mm -hmm. But you know, our, our view is, is that you do want equity allocation, and then what you do then is try to go to the best managers of that equity. So how would this fit into someone's portfolio then? Because when we talk, most people, you know, 60% equities, 40% bonds, where would you fit in alternative investing? Steve, what? Well, I mean, you know, Right now, like I said, there, there's a, a, a massive wave of, of, of everybody clamoring for, for a 3% paying U.S. dollar denominated 10-year bond, right. which ultimately will, will, will generate no rate of return for all these people. Um, so for me, I, I'd be moving out of bonds and, and, and moving equities. The interesting thing, I just want to pick up on one thing Andrea said, which is that... that both of our firms are 
positive and long term. And so we really, in the last three years, um, have not actually had the market tailwinds that we might otherwise, you know, like I said, from 74 to 2000, you had a, you know, you had a straight up market. And we've managed to outperform despite equities not really uh, generating any performance. Mm -hmm. So when things get going, uh, we'll really outperform the market. That's my opinion. Andrew, what do you think? What kind of a balance should folks have? Well, I, I, th I think the, the ultimate asset allocation is, is so individual. Right. I mean, to start at 60-40, it, it, you really want to look at the person's um, investment horizon. If it's long, you probably want to gear more towards longer-term assets. Uh, it depends on their income needs. It depends on their risk tolerance. So all of those things play a role. Uh, you know, so we uh, the 60-40 split, I think, is is sort of some hypothetical, right. generic thing that actually doesn't apply to many individuals. And once we're on the topic of portfolio construction, if you look at, at a portfolio in Europe or in the U.S., certainly pension funds, they have enormous allocations to alternatives generally and hedge funds specifically. In Canada, you don't see the same kind of allocations. And I wonder if you can both comment on the role of the Canadian advisors, many of whom are, of course, are at banks, and their antipathy towards hedge funds. Is it a lack of knowledge on the investor side, on the advisor side? Is it a misunderstanding of what you do? And you got about 10 I, seconds each. <laughs> well, I, I think it's early days. I think that will be a, a, a growing platform over the next 10 years, will be um, allocation into hedge funds. It's okay. just beginning. I agree. We do see that movement increasing. I think the, the next step will be, instead of uh, alternative strategies being a bucket to the side, that they actually become part of people's core portfolios, either as equity managers or fixed okay. income managers. All right. Well, listen, thank you both very much for joining us. Andrea Horan and uh, Steve Tuckner. And that's all the time we have for today's program. If you've got a question about alternative investments, email us at alternativeinvesting at bnn.ca. Thanks for watching.